What's going on, everyone? Happy Sunday evening. I hope you're, I'm, I've got the Masters on over here on the other window. So I hope you're enjoying your Sunday watching the Masters wrap up. Looks like Scotty Scheffler is going to bring home another gold jacket. Uh, but we wanted to jump in here and talk about the Cincinnati real estate market. What's going on? It is definitely heating up. I've got a few stories to share with you guys. I've got some stats to show with you guys to show what's actually happening in the data in terms of median prices, in terms of amount of inventory that's out there in terms of days on market. We've also got some other real estate news to get into in terms of what's happening here in the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky market. As always, would love to hear where you guys are watching from. Um, so thankful for you guys watching this channel. We're helping more and more people who are finding us via uh, our content. Let me know about the reels. Uh, we've I hired a full-time videographer. So you may see it's not just me out there holding my cell phone now. I've actually got someone with talent uh, shooting and some of that content is start, starting to come out uh, both in the long form videos and the shorts. And so I hope you guys are enjoying that. We're trying to get just more and more content out there that's helpful, that's valuable, that is worth it to you to help you make a decision if you're looking to buy or sell a house or if you're thinking about moving to Cincinnati or the, or the Northern Kentucky area. Uh, we want to be your real estate resource of choice. We want to be the number one team for you. And my job, as I see it, is help you understand this city, help you understand these neighborhoods, help you understand what's going on in the real estate market. So we're going to talk about all that tonight. Uh, and if we get time, we might even jump into a little bangles conversation. Um, I've actually got, uh, if you stick around to the end of the show, I've got a little bit of a surprise announcement to make uh, along lines of the Cincinnati Bengals that I'm really excited about. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but there's going to be some overlap here with this channel and another channel in town um, that is connected to the Cincinnati Bengals. So I'm really excited about that. And there should be some fun stuff coming there. I'll talk to you about that. Okay. I'm watching more comment out of the bunker here. All right. I'm going to jump into this data. And again, as always, let us know where you're watching from. I love when you guys are interactive here in the comments. And uh, if you have any questions, I am ha happy to, uh, to, to answer them as we go, want to tell you what's going on in the market uh, as we get started. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and pop this uh, this up here. So um, we're gonna go through some charts and some data. Like I said, I want to talk about the average price. In fact, I'll go full screen on this so you guys can kind of see it. See if I can make this get any bigger. Uh, not much, not a whole lot bigger. Okay. So um, you know what we're seeing in the market. Uh, we're gonna look at three charts here, and then I'll tell you a little bit of of a story around what we had with a client. Uh, going on this weekend and the offers that we're seeing um, helping our clients secure homes uh, in the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area. So this this uh, this first chart is the median price of sold homes. This is a, covering a two year period. This first bar here is back in March of 2022. We've got the data here of March 2024. Uh, over that time period, the median price has gone up 17 percent over the two years uh, when you're comparing March to March on a two-year basis. What I want you to see, um, and these dotted lines are the peak. So 294 is where we're at now. 251 is where we were two years ago. By the way, this is looking at the Cincinnati side from the MLS is where I'm pulling these stats from all the home sales in Claremont, Warren, Butler, and Hamilton County uh, counties, which are the uh, you know, the primary counties in the Cincinnati area where the most homes are sold. We're also looking at single family, condo, townhouse, and townhouse and land aluminum data. Um, what I want to point out though here is this jump in price from January to February and February to March. So these are pretty big leaps. Now, again, if you go back to 2023, this is fairly standard of what we will see in a market coming out of winter, typically December. January are our lowest months, maybe even February in terms of median price. And then you jump up in March, April, May, and June often are the highest in terms of uh, home prices. Uh, what we're seeing here in 2024, we saw prices kind of dip from last fall into the winter. Uh, that was typical in January, but we saw a big leap from January to February, another big leap from February to March. So prices are going up. We continue to, to kind of mention this on the channel, um, letting you guys kind of know what's going on. Should you wait? Should you, uh, should you sit it out? Is the market going to crash? Is there going to be a, a bubble burst? Um, I've basically said the same thing for the last two and a half, three years now, at least on this channel and longer than that with my clients, which is like, look, we're short on inventory. It's really hard to see prices going down. And I, I did have some, in fact, I had a client 
reach out recently who uh, moved here from California and decided to rent around 2020. And I was like, man, and he was like, I think it's a bubble. I think it's going to burst. I think prices are going to go down. I'm going to wait it out. He waited, he waited, he waited. We're, you know, three, four years. It might've been 2021 when he moved here, but we're three, four years later now. And, you know, if he would have bought a, let's just call it a $300,000 house three years ago, we've seen about 10% each year. So let's call it, um, you know, 30% of appreciation. He lost out on 90K of appreciation just in three years. And what we're seeing here in 2024 at the beginning is it's not slowing down, people. Um, so prices are going to continue to go up. This is going to be both resale and new construction. So, um, you know, I'll show you this in the next chart here in just a second. But typically what we'll see is, again, the highest amount of inventory, um, the longest days on market, and the lowest prices are going to be in those winter months, December, January, February, maybe even November a little bit. But now that we're hitting this spring market market in 2024, we are seeing um, we are seeing these prices rise. All right, I'm going to keep going here on the chart. Uh, okay, I want to show you this next one, which is the supply and demand of units sold. So again, what is driving prices? Uh, last week's video, I got into the the uh, settlement that happened with the NAR a little bit and talking about, okay, if you're negotiable with real estate commissions, is that going to bring down prices? And the answer guys is no. What, what drives prices for housing is supply and demand. So what we're seeing in this chart, the red bar is the amount of homes for sale. The green bar is the amount of homes sold. And again, what I just want to kind of compare here is March to March of 22. And we've got less inventory now than we did in 2022 and slightly more than we had about a year ago in terms of overall inventory. And then ho home sold, we sold more in 2022. Last year, uh, as a whole, in Janu in 23, we, uh, the Cincinnati market sold about 20%, 25% less homes overall on the year. And that's really because there, there weren't a lot of houses on the market. Because what was happening is the you know sellers who are locked into that three two, maybe even two, two, three, four, five percent. They got a ton of equity in their home and then they would have to sell their house that yes, you could cash in on the equity. You can put that down towards the next house, but they didn't want to get a home at six, seven, eight percent interest rate. So you had all that inventory from the sellers standing still. And so we just didn't sell a lot of homes last year. The buyers wanted it. It was a combination of sellers, you know, wanting to keep that rate and say, well, maybe I'll just do an addition on the house or something like that. Um, and interest rates going up in the fall, you know, hitting that, that high of around 8% and a lot of buyers backed out. What we're seeing right now in 2024 is a lot of those buyers who backed out of the market in 2023 are jumping back in. So um, again, what we're what I'm seeing is houses that are priced right, that are on the market, that are, um, when I say price right, I mean, uh, the listing agent's done a good job of looking at the comps and they're not shooting too high, even though prices are going up. They're pricing the home for what they think it will sell for, if not a little bit below it. And and the, and some some agents I'm seeing out there are listing it quite a bit below. Um, and the reason why they're doing that is because you've got all this pent up demand from last year, plus the demand of this year, and they're they come flocking to those houses. So if you see a house, you're like, "There's a deal, I'm gonna go." Well, you show up, and there's five other people in the house, and there's eleven other offers on hand that you got to beat, and three of them are cash. You know, and so it's challenging. That's where we're at again in the real estate market. Pardon me. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is supply and demand. We're seeing a little bit more homes sold than last year in terms of March to March. Excuse me. If I'm looking at this carefully, I think it's, uh, sorry, let me put this back up for you. It's um, slightly less than we sold last year. In February, we sold slightly, slightly more. So it's about even. Bottom line is inventory is still kind of low here. Um, let me go to the next chart. And I want to show you this even more. So this is, okay, this last chart is months supply of inventory. Again, going over two years. And the line chart in the middle is the average days on market, okay? So in a balanced market, let me explain this real quick. In a balanced market, not a seller's market, not a buyer's market, you have six months of inventory in that in that market. So what that means is, a, is if no new houses came on the market for sale, 
all of the existing inventory that's on the market would be sold in six months. Okay. Now let's take a look at this chart and say, we have not sniffed anywhere near six months of inventory in, you know, in over five years, six years, uh, probably maybe even seven years. And so it's been a seller's market. It continues to be a seller's market. Now the biggest peak we see here is going back to last winter. And I was trying to tell you guys, I was like, buy a house. This is the best I've seen in a while. Um, because, uh, days on market was creeping up this again. Now this is average days on market. So this includes all the homes that are in bad shape are, are priced are overpriced that this includes all of the homes. Okay. So a home that is priced, right. That's hitting the market and, uh, is in good condition. The pictures look good. It's staged. Well, those things are sold in one or two days. Okay. Or as long as the seller wants to leave it open to collect offers basically. And, um, I've had a couple instances, interestingly enough, uh, I'll tell this story, man, I had a sell, I had a buyer, uh, an out of town buyer. And, um, we went and did a virtual tour for him. A home showed up kind of in Claremont County, nice home, brick home, two story. And, uh, we, when we, uh, do a showing, we always reach out to that listing agent to try to get a feel of where you at from offers. And can we build up some rapport so that they know, Hey, look, I want to work with team Stanio. They're going to make it easy. They've got a transaction coordinator. Their buyers always close. They've got good lenders. So we kind of got this, like we're known for being good buyers. And that helps when we reach out to the listing agent. Well, this agent, um, you know, they had another offer in hand. We knew that. Um, and, but by the time we were able to kind of, um, do the showing it was getting pretty late at night. It was like eight, nine o'clock. And we said, Hey, I, we know you've got this other offer. Uh, we want to offer strong buyers. Uh, can we, can we do the offer tomorrow morning? And typically sellers will be like, yeah, if we've got, we want to, we want to get multiple offers. We want more buyers coming in because the more offers, the better for sellers usually, because you can, you know, take the best one. You can look at the price. You can maybe get them. You can go back to them and say, Hey, we want your highest and best offer now. Uh, we want better terms. You can kind of pin them against each other. In this scenario, it was kind of crazy because the seller, the listing agent said, Hey, the seller really wants to wrap it up tonight. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know why you want to do that. Like you got another offer coming in. Uh, the only reason, I mean, there's, there, there could be some reasons. One reason could be like, you're stressed out about it. You don't want people in the house. There could be medical issues. There could be reasons for it, but typically they'll say, yeah, get us an offer by the next morning. We'll review by noon or something like that. You've got time, but we had to act fast. And, uh, I had to kind of, um, uh, not necessarily show my hand, but I had to, cause the listing agent got back to me and said, um, Hey, we're, we're about to accept this other offer. We're just doing one minor change. And so I had to kind of kick it into gear and be like, well, is your offer this good? You know, cause our seller, our, my buyer who had told me that I could do this was like, uh, saying, uh, was okay for me to show like, Hey, pump the brakes so that we can get our offer in basically. And so we ended up, what we ended up doing was an escalation addendum and winning, even though they still didn't decide. To, <laughs> I got that offer together at like 10 o'clock, got it over to them by, cause they're like, we want to decide by 10 30. So I like booked it and got them the offer. Uh, my team was awesome. And then they're like, well, the seller wants to sleep on it and <laughs> review in the morning. I'm like, okay, whatever. We'll do what it takes to win for our buyers. Uh, I got no problem with that. Uh, we did end up winning and, um, or, you know, we're working through inspections now. Everything's moving, moving forward. It's great. But that was a weird situation. Normally, sellers want to collect multiple offers um, and they'll give just a few days to do that. So looking back at this chart, what I want to point out again is uh, where inventory was back in December. We're like, oh, look at this. We're sniffing, you know, 2.8, almost three months of inventory. But then, bam, it dropped down in January. And then, bam, a huge drop in February. And then here back in March, we're down at 0.9 months of inventory again. So we're back under one month of inventory, super low again, as we're back into this spring market where houses are selling fast. So if you guys are monitoring Zillow. If you're getting um, homes from us from an MLS portal, you might be like, hey, I like this one. And uh, it's like, great. Uh, are you ready to offer right now? Um, it's basically where we're at. Now that's for the homes, I will say that are, again, priced right and in good condition because there are, you can see the average, you know, even while this is coming down from 35, 30 down back to around, what is that? Uh, maybe 18 days on market 
um, overall. And last year, that was it's a little higher than it was last year. So they are slightly, you know, just or actually here's March last year. No, it's a, it's a little under my mistake. <laughs> I think this year is actually going to continue. So rates have still, you know, hung up there around the, the sixes. Uh, I think they hit seven again this week for 30 year uh, fixed. And they're, they've, they said that they're going to drop, but they haven't really been dropping. People were like, oh, they might get, get down into the sixes, even into the fives. And it just hasn't happened yet. So there's still, I think, some buyers who are like waiting for that. But even so, there's so much demand that this inventory has dropped all the way down. Um, so another story I'll share about uh, kind of the market is we had um, we had multiple buyers put in offers over the weekend uh, where we were doing showings. Um, we had one. We did the showing on uh, what is today? Today's Sunday. We did the showing on Friday, and the sellers were um, the home was cute. Is about three hundred thousand dollar home in Fairfax and it had an addition on it. Um, very cute, very nice home. And we knew just by looking at the comps, like this is going to go for probably 340, 350. And so <clears throat> they listed at 300. So that's what I'm saying. You're, you might see some of these houses that are out there and you're like, Oh, that's a deal. Um, but really what they're, what the sellers are doing is they're just, they're going to let the market dictate the price. And what I mean by that is they're comfortable knowing that if they go under, people are going to look at it as a deal. They're going to swarm in there and then they're going to fall in love. And then they're going to give their highest and best offer. The market sets the highest price. Uh, if you're a seller, by the way, and we love working with sellers, um, I just say that the worst thing you can do right now is try, is try to price the home too high. If you price the home too high because, well, my neighbor got this and the appreciation should make it this. Uh, and plus I've got the... I don't know, pool table. We put $2,000 into our pool table, whatever it is. Um, don't do that, okay? Don't do that. If you go too high and you sit on the market, that's the worst thing you could do right now in a seller's market with low inventory because then people are going to be like, it's, it's sitting a week and people are going to be like, what's wrong with that one? Why is that? So why is that still sitting there? What's wrong with it? And then you're only going to get one offer, uh, and maybe it's two weeks in, maybe it's three weeks in, that offer is going to be other, under your list price, or you might've even had to drop the list price before you got an offer. Don't go too high. Don't go too high, sellers, okay? Um, if you have questions about what your home is worth, I recommend that you talk to a real estate agent. Uh, we would love to be that real estate agent. I know what Zillow says your home is worth, okay? I know. I know what Zillow says your home is worth. And I know that's very comforting. Um, and, and maybe you even got an alert and said that your Zestimate went up. Um, you Probably everyone's getting those, but just please don't list your home too high. Okay, that's the data I wanted to start with. Um, I hope that helps you guys. In terms of understanding where the real estate market is, we are short on supply. Prices are going up. Days on market are going down. Um, and so if you're interested in buying in this market right now, you know we've got plenty of tips on, on how to help you out. Uh, I recommend if you're buying a resale home that you, wherever your budget is, wherever you're comfortable after you've get, been pre-approved and talked with your lender and say, I'm comfortable at whatever, $2,000 a month, 25, 3,000, 4,000 a month, um, that you shop for homes at a price point below that number. Uh, so here's another story I'm going to tell you. Um, Excuse me. Thanks. So that house in Fairfax is listed at 300. I uh, recommended a few things to my buyers. I'm like, Hey, look, here's the comps. It's going to go well over that. The, you know, there's comps from 330 to 350. The highest was 350. I think you need to go that high. They're like, yep, we trust you. Now they were uh, pre-approved up to 375. So they're like, we can do it. We love this house. Let's go for it. I'm like, great. That's step number one. Step number two, you're, you have a loan. And so um, beating any kind of cash offer is really hard. Uh, cause you have to get an appraisal and they don't, uh, and cash can close fast and you've got to get the, the loan underwritten. So, um, now I've got some lenders who can close in two weeks, three weeks. Um, and they are great. Uh, so I've got some fantastic lenders to point you guys to, uh, shout out Matt Flieger, UM Cincy, shout out Jeff Bostic at guaranteed rate. Um, but look, they, you know, it's hard to be cash. The other thing uh, you can do in, in a scenario with multiple offers is, tinker with the inspections. You can waive the inspection completely. If you feel comfortable with the house, uh, you can have an inspector even go in there with you early. Uh, that's hard to coordinate. I will, I will admit, especially in a really fast market. 
Uh, but sometimes, sometimes you can get an inspector to go in there with you early enough and just be like, is there anything major wrong with this house? Now, typically your real estate agent should be able to point that out, but we're not inspectors. We're real estate agents. So we can do our best on that. Um, but if you waive inspections, that's attractive to the seller because they're like, great, don't need to pay for any repairs. And we're one step closer, closer to closing. Another thing that we do, if you don't want to waive the inspection, which I totally understand why you would not want to do that. I don't like making my clients do that. I never make them. I don't like really presenting that, but sometimes you have to do it to win. It just depends on how crazy the market is and how motivated you are to win. Um, so we're going to kind of follow your lead on that. If you're like, Eric, get us this house, no matter what, then I'm like, you need to waive inspections. Uh, and how much cash do you have? Cause we need to do an appraisal gap if you're getting a loan. Um, and can you sell your first board? <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. Um, but the, um, so where was I? Oh, inspections. Another thing that we do. So if you hear me talk about this and you're looking to buy a house here uh, in the future, we might do something like, hey, the buyer will write this in as, a, as an additional statement into the contract. Buyer is willing to not ask for any repairs from the seller on any individual item up to 500 bucks or uh, $1,000 or any individual item that would cost $500 or less to repair. So you got to kind of have to estimate that. But essentially what you're doing is you're saying to the sellers, we're not sweating the small stuff. Okay. I don't care about your broken seal in your window. I don't care about your, uh, dripping faucet. I can fix the dripping faucet, um, or the nail pop or, or the trim that is, uh, needs some paint or the, uh, I don't care about the caulking around the windows. I can do the caulking. You're saying, I'm not going to ask for any of those things. But if there's something big, like uh, there's a plumbing backup, there is a, a electric that's really dangerous. There's a furnace that's not working or an air conditioner that's not working. There's water coming into the basement. Uh, this wall, basement wall is cracked in Boeing. Like any major thing like that, um, you still have uh, that right to ask for those repairs because they're more than likely going to cost over $500. Make sense? So that's another way doesn't waive it completely. It's better to waive it. Um, so in this scenario, we offered, uh, the other thing we did was in terms of price, because what sellers want is they want the best price and best terms. So uh, typically that means if they can get cash and they can close fast, if they want to close fast, or they can get occupancy for as long as they want occupancy, um, that's the best. And then, uh, and the highest, the most amount of money, right? Um, but sometimes they might take less amount of money if they get the terms they want. So let's say someone waives inspections or let's say um, somebody gives them occupancy for two or three or four weeks after they close on the house. That way they can pack, they can move at their own leisure. They can take the money from the closing of the sale of that house and go close on the sale of their other home and then move into that home. So th there's a lot of other things that sellers might want. And right now, because again, we are here, uh, <laughs> in terms of inventory in a seller's market, sellers can kind of dictate the terms a little bit. So um, anyway, that's where we're at. We, um, oh, one other thing, we did an escalation addendum. So I wanna go ahead and explain this because I usually talk to buyers about this. An escalation addendum is basically like, um, if you've ever, if you remember eBay had this max bid feature where you were you know, bidding uh, against other people in, a, um, in an auction, you could set, let's say the thing was 20 bucks, but you're like, you know what? I'm willing to pay 40 bucks for that thing. And I don't want to sit around here for 10 hours uh, every time it goes up. So you can say 20 bucks, but I'll beat anyone else uh, and up to my max of 40. You can do that basic same thing when you're buying a house. Uh, it's called an escalation addendum. We say we're willing to beat any other buyer by uh, as much as 3000 or $5,000. It needs to be significant enough that the sellers will bite on it. Um, like, oh, three grand more. That's nice. I'll take that. Uh, five grand more. I'll take that. Uh, the, the, the listing agent has to provide pr written proof of the other offer. Otherwise it doesn't kick in. Uh, but you say we'll beat anyone by let's say five grand up to our max of three fifty. And it was a $300,000 house. That's basically what we did with this offer. Um, and so what happens if the seller has another offer, let's say at three forty, yours automatically kicks in with the escalation and denim. Now yours is at three forty five. So you might've made a, a base purchase, uh, a base offer on the purchase price of 300, but you have the escalation in denim that beats any other offer net terms. So, uh, you know, purchase price minus seller paid closing costs or 
home ins- uh, home warranty or owner's title insurance or anything like that. Net price uh, up until your max. And so that's a way, uh, the, the reason why we like using those is it's a way to help you win and beat anyone else, but not spend so much that you're bidding blind against yourself. You're, otherwise, you're like, I don't know what the highest other offer is. I'll, I guess I'll do 350. Do I need to do 360? I don't know, 360. And maybe the next highest offer was 340. And you just spent 20 grand over and the seller's like, yeah. <laughs> so sellers usually try to, um, you know, sometimes they might even say, we don't want your uh, escalation addendums. Only give us your highest and best. Um, and, you know, that's kind of up to you. You can decide if you want to kind of tick off the seller and send one anyway. Um, or if you just want to kind of send your highest and best, it's that's kind of a dance um, and a bit of an art to the, to the offer that, that your real estate agent can help you out with. Okay. Um, that is that. So that's that story. Oh, by the way, want, want, we lost that offer. Uh, 11 offers. The agent was kind about it. They're like, thanks for all your work. Uh, the sellers went with a cash offer that's closing in two weeks. And we had, uh, yeah, we had 11 offers. Uh, they waived the inspections and they didn't need an appraisal uh, because it was cash. And uh, my buyers, if you're watching, we're good sports. They're like, hey, that's a hard one to beat. And that's what I said. It's like, it's hard to beat cash if you're not a cash buyer, um, especially cash that's waiving inspections. That's a tough one to beat. So keep your chin up. And uh, we'll get out there and we'll get the next one. I'm going to share my screen here in a second. Let me do this. Did Scheffler win it, guys? Looks like he's getting in the jacket now. Yeah, Scotty Scheffler won. Okay. All right, let's go here. Share. And close that. One second. Okay. All right, uh, let's go through a few articles. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna kind of blast through these again. If you guys have comments, appreciate all you guys who are watching. Uh, feel free to jump them in, the ch- uh, drop them in the chat, and we'll go from there. Uh, downtown Vitality Index. The city. These cities are best positioned for sex, success in the hybrid area. Done a few, um, uh, you know, art- articles. Shared some articles on here on the lives, and done a few videos around downtown and um how challenging it is once people are you know not working downtown and that's across the nation that's just not citywide a lot of people are changing them into uh residential areas last year miami topped this index thanks to its strong momentum for office real estate thriving tourist economy and work from home rates that remain only slightly above the national average uh but what was interesting to me is wichita kansas nashville tennessee cincinnati and orlando also finished near the top in downtown vitality index, which is based on a weighted formula that looks at these factors, downtown office, commercial real estate trends, urban central business district, hotel occupancy, percentage of individuals working from home, downtown cell phone activity compared to pre pandemic levels, public transit ridership trends and Metro uh, population growth momentum. So since he's in the, is one of the top cities here in terms of its overall vitality, here it is one, two, three, four. How about that? 64% 64% in this index. Cities that Cincinnati is beating out. Tampa, uh, Albany, New York, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, Dayton, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, Birmingham, Alabama, D.C., Kansas City, Missouri. Take that, Chiefs. Uh, Boston, Milwaukee, New York, Austin, Phoenix, Georgia, Atlanta. I mean, okay, basically all the other major metros. Okay, San Fran, Chicago, St. Louis, not doing so hot. Cincy, knocking it out. So right on. Good job, Cincy. Downtown Vitality. Um, important to know if you come downtown, um, you know, good real estate trends, uh, urban central business district hotel occupancy, cell phone activity, public transit, ridership trends, and metro population growth momentum. So that's cool. Wanted to share that. All right, moving on. Article number two tonight. Fisher Homes unveils a $100 million, 306 lot Pebble Grove planned community in Goshen Township. Where is Goshen Township, you might ask? It's on the east side. Get you guys familiar here. Out a little bit past... um, How do I get full screen? Open in maps. Past Batavia, a little northeast. Uh, Sorry, north of Batavia and northeast of Milford. So you're taking 50 out from Milford to Goshen Township. And this one is called Pebble Grove. 
Pebble Grove, Goshen Township, Fisher. All right. There it is. Right off of Linton Road, right across from an elementary school, right across from Goshen Middle School. Okay. So um, my my guess on these, and they're just coming out, um, 100 million, 113 acres, Fisher Homes decision, shows the strength and quality of Goshen School District. Um, in fact, I'm interested in that. Let's look at that. Niche.com, Goshen Township. Housing, good for families. Uh, a minus for jobs, a minus for outdoor activity. Okay. So B plus school is not the top in the area, but what you're getting out here is you're going to get some affordability for new construction close to schools. Um, so success in Claremont County they're they've been, um, selling out w really well there in Batavia Fisher has, um, what I want to show you was kind of the price point here. So 45, oh, I like this too. And amenities, the community will include a playground seating and recreational fields around 45 acres will be preserved as green space uh, pedestrian circulation and pedestrian safety were pri prioritized in the design uh, it's going to be their maple street collection now that's that's their most affordable line 164 families are going to be maple street 56 uh homes are going to be designer that's their next level up and then masterpiece is their highest and 85 low maintenance ranch homes from its paired patio home collection i did a video out in uh where was that? Um, I'm trying to remember, but the paired patio homes were, it was, is in Ohio, uh, kind of Northeast side of town, I think. Uh, but the paired patios were around 300,000. My guess is in fact, let's see if we have prices. I don't see prices yet. The overall density would be 2.59 dwelling units per acre. Um, that's pretty great in terms of space. So you're getting a little bit of space. You're going to get some affordability. Uh, my guess is these homes will be like between three and 400,000. Um, you know, the, the designers will probably be in the fours and fives would be my guess on pricing. Um, let's see if this is up yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and when they, they get a model home, Grove, Goshen, do we have prices? Do we have prices? Not yet. So we'll keep an eye on out on this for you. Um, but why do I continue to bring up uh, new construction? Um, by the way, here are the largest home builders in the Cincinnati area. You got Fisher, Drees, and MI. Uh, I need to start doing some videos of MI homes as well. They're a little bit more expensive than Drees and Fisher, I believe, but they do have good quality. Largest, oh, I have to pay for that? Come on. Come on, I'm already paying for you. Okay, so... Um, so there you go, 100 and 113 acres on the east side, Linton Road, and 164 Maple Street homes, 56 designer, and 85 pair patio homes. What is that? So around 300 homes, right? Um, 306 lot. Yeah. So that's a big development going in in Goshen Township. One of the guys, and, and again, the guys, the reason I keep bringing up new construction, I just shared with you where we're at from the market being hot in the spring. And uh, and I, I'm not trying to push you one way or the other. I'm, the, there's pros and cons to each. You're going to get more square footage and probably be closer into town if you buy a resale house. I mean, you could buy one anywhere, but um, you know, your, your, square, your price per square foot is going to be less in a resale home. Um, however, you might need to make some, some repairs, some some updates. The roof might be 15 years old. The furnace might be 15 years old. So you gotta you gotta account for those costs. You gotta account for you know your time and energy and effort into making the house into um, you know updated the way you want it. Um, but you know overall, it's probably going to be a little cheaper. You also will probably get a little bit bigger lot because with these new construction homes, you know they're building this one. This, this sounds pretty nice that they're leaving some space and I hope you're at least getting like a third of an acre. That would be great. Maybe not that much. You might not get that much. But if you go back into the homes from the the 90s and the early 2000s in northern Kentucky and Cincinnati that were built, you're seeing a third to like, you know, 0.4, maybe even 0.5 acres pretty consistently in those neighborhoods that were built. Now that there's more demand and less supply and builders are trying to catch up. They're, 
they're cramming them in. <laughs> uh, you have a little bit less space. But the plus side of going new construction is it's new construction and everything is brand new and the roof is new and the furnace is new and you don't have to go duke it out in a competitive buyer's market in a hot real estate market. You don't have to waive inspections. You get to have multiple inspections and you get to go walk the property and you've got, you know, you do a home orientation. I'm doing one. No, I'm doing a closing tomorrow. Home we got multiple new construction homes closing with our clients soon. So there's a lot of that this week. Um, but you get to walk through the house with a roll of tape and any little thing that you see wrong, you get to mark up and they'll fix it for you before you buy the house. It's wonderful. Uh, and then you have a warranty for 90 days where they'll fix anything you want. Then you've got a warranty for a year where they'll fix basically anything inside the house. And you got 10 year warranty on the foundation. And so there's a lot of advantages to, to new construction. There's a reason why, um, you know, I, 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 sh I show those videos on this channel, but obviously we can help you with both. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think overall there's, I guess there's stress to both, um, you know, both decisions you make on the resale. It's usually a shorter time frame. Stress <laughs> is probably the best way to say that because, uh, you have to win in the offers. You have to, you know, make potentially move fast and be aggressive with your offer, but you're typically closing in 30 days. Whereas new construction, it's easier to get under contract because you're typically not you know, unless it's a new phase and there's a lot of demand for certain lots, you're not competing against a lot of other buyers, um, though lots can go at any time. Um, but, you, you know, it's it's a little bit less stress on getting it under contract. It's maybe a little bit longer period of stress while it's being built, you know, because um, you're you're what, you know, your multiple email chains and you're watching it and. It's kind of fun though at the same time because they're like, hey, we did the framing this week. We put on the roof this week. The windows went in this week and you're getting these pictures as you go. Um, so you get to see the whole thing put together. That's kind of fun. Okay, going to move on here. Um, another quick uh, headline. Over in the west side, pre, uh, Priya place to add $1 million plus homes to Cincinnati's west side. A uh, residential real estate team is starting to work on a development that will open up a new option for luxury custom homes on the west side. Ram Real Estate Group at Coldwell Banker is developing Priya Place, a 12-home, so very small, 12-home subdivision in Green Township. Rakesh Ram said the new development will, uh, I hope I'm, I'm probably butchering that name, uh, Rakesh, Rakesh, uh, said the new development will offer buyers to state home sites, roughly an acre in size to build custom homes. Dave Ott Homes is the exclusive home builder. So you can't bring your home builder in. Uh, it's going to be Dave Ott Homes. I haven't worked with them, but uh, I, I'd love to go check those out. So they're going to be a million dollar price point. Uh, West side, working on it for a while. 20 minutes from downtown, 25 minutes to Kenwood Town Center. They're going to be in the Oak Hills local school district. Um, Ott's niche market since the COVID-19 has been large estate homes on more land. So if, if that's something that's attractive to you, I know I did uh, a video out in uh, Union, Kentucky with um, the Enclave at Courtney Estates where they have an acre plus, and that's pretty rare. So uh, you're paying more for it. If you want to get an acre plus and new construction, yeah, you're going to be at this million dollar price point or more. Uh, but here it has already four or five potential buyers. <laughs> so there's only potentially, um, what, seven to eight homes left even without advertising, he said. So, uh, and maybe, you know, those are potential. So who knows if those are actually going to get under contract or not. Ott has a stellar reputation as a custom home builder. He understands what the custom home buyer is looking for. Um, so if you're a custom, custom home buyer looking for larger acre, uh, West Side, Oak Hill School District, uh, million dollar plus. Let's kind of show you where this is. Uh, I like this area of town. Um, out around dead so up interstate 74 so you're going to pop on 74 to get into downtown fairly easily from there so there you go all right there's another one um another uh, quick article here uh Dries is is building liberty township but they've got a they've got to go back to the drawing board on some of the density con concerns because uh the zoning commission shot it down so uh if you're looking for Dries opening up with John Henry there in Liberty Township. Got to wait a little bit longer on that one. That is going back to the drawing board. Um, another another quick article or headline here, Covington officials break ground on Central Riverfront Project. This is at the former IRS site. So this is going up. This is a $125 million uh, plan to design and build the Commonwealth Center for Biomedical Excellence at the Center Riverfront site. Uh, Bashir issued, uh, Governor Bashir issued a veto message 
with four minor technical changes to the bill that left a balance of it intact, bringing the project one step closer to reality. So that's coming in. Just want to point out, um, you know, these development projects as they're happening. A lot of them are happening in Covington, Newport, closer to downtown Cincinnati. Um, so just wanted to point that out, that that is going on. Um, this headline caught my eye, not necessarily for the business uh, itself, but um, is this the same one? This might be the wrong one. <laughs> oh, no, here it is. It's a uh, so commercial moving firm, Ray Hamilton. I think they changed the headline. Land City, Jobs Ohio Incentives, and Move to Sharonville. And um, Ray Hamilton is a fourth-generation Cincinnati commercial moving company founded on 4th Street in 1892. Um, uh, I need a drink. Throat's hurting. Okay. I'm not going to spend too long on this, but I just wanted to point out the fact that um, one of the things that I love about Cincinnati is – uh, the longevity you can have for your family here. This is, uh, I, I think this is my favorite thing about the city. It's not something I knew when I moved here with my family. When I was six years old, turning seven, we moved from Michigan back in 1988. Um, I grew up here. We moved here with Delta Airlines. My dad was a pilot and we stayed here. And what I've realized in being in this place, it's, it's a great place to raise a family. Um, it's a great city for economic diversity. And so we're not overly, uh, you know, dependent on any one specific injury, uh, industry, not injury. And, um, you know, cause my, like I said, I, my family's from Michigan. I watched kind of what happened with Detroit and that what was the largest kind of wealthiest city in the world just bust when the, you know, when the, when it lost the automotive, uh, business there. And that, that was a blow to the entire, not just the city, but the state. And so that's in part, you know, I think, uh, now, my, my parents grew up north of there a couple hours in kind of farming country, but um, they moved away. My dad, his brother, his sister, they all moved away to get jobs. They moved to Dallas, Chicago, and Cincinnati. Uh, I like Cincinnati, though, because I, uh, you know, like I said, it, it's diverse. The cost of living is low. It's a beautiful city. I love the arts. I love um, the sports that are here. I love the restaurants that are here. Um, it's got a lot going for it for a fairly small, you know, in comparison, I, I think we rank around 25th or so in terms of the overall metro population in the United States. And we we kind of fly under the radar um, in, in many ways. And again, I like that. So what what stands out to me about this article, uh, again, and I, you see this a lot here in Cincinnati, is that a fourth generation Cincinnati commercial moving company founded on 4th Street in 1892, you know, they moved to a new location. And I just, I just think that's cool. Um, my tagline here at the business is find your home, strengthen your family. And so our beliefs are that um, home is where families grow stronger and strong families bless the city and the world. And so what I love about Cincinnati, uh, and I'm kind of networked and, um, cr and linked arms with a lot of families here in the city who have a vision of like, we want to build a really strong family here and we want to, um, we want to see our kids uh, bless the city. And, and I know that's religious language. Not everyone watching this is religious. That's okay. Uh, but we, basically what I mean by that is, you know, we want to, uh, we want to live in a great city <laughs> and we want to serve people well, and we want to, um, leave things better than we found it. And we're trying to instill all that in our kids and all my friends have five kids or more like me pretty much. So, um, we have a lot of kids and we're training them to say, we want to leave this place better than we found it. And so I, I think this is a great city for that. I would love that if Team Sanyo becomes a second, third, fourth generation family business, that would be, um, I, I can't think of anything better. That's That would be a huge win. And so I just want to call out, there are businesses like this here that have been doing it since the, you know, since the mid to 1800s. And I just think that's really cool. So uh, Ray Hamilton and family, congratulations on your move. I know you probably will never see this. And you don't know who I am, um, but you know a commercial moving company is into their fourth generation for a family business. I just think that's awesome. Okay, that's it for that. All right. Um, last thing uh, I mentioned, I've got a bit of an announcement here. Um, that is a fun announcement for me. So, um, so Bengals draft is coming up mid April. You guys know I got I got Chase and Burrow here on the wall. I'm a big fan, big fan of Cincinnati sports. Took me a while. I was you know. Was a Lions fan, Michigan Wolverines fan, Detroit Pistons fan, Detroit Tigers fan. Still root for those teams. 
Uh, but around, it took me basically till around high school. I was that kid in elementary and middle school. I was like, I'm a Michigan fan. And, uh, you know, all my friends who were UK fans were like, shut up. So, um, the, what was I going to say? Ah, the draft, the draft's coming up. Okay. So we're going to talk a little, um, but I'm all in on Bengals. I, I, I don't have cable. So I very rarely, one of the reasons why I watch the NFL and the Bengals more than anything else is like the only thing I can watch on TV anymore, uh, for live sports. So I watch it with my, my kids. Uh, I invite friends over to watch the games. Um, sometimes we record it. We watch it on tape delay so that we can do the things we need to do with our family. Um, so, but I love the Bengals. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I've listened to way, way too many mock draft podcasts <laughs> in this off season. Uh, if you're a Bengals fan out there, let me know who you're thinking about uh, for a draft pick at 18. For me personally, trenches, 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 trenches. I want an O line man, and uh, I want one of these tackles. Maybe a tackle who can play guard and upgrade at Volson for now. For if Trent Brown goes down or Orlando Brown goes down, you can swing right in there. Um, if, if Murphy is there, great. If Johnny Newton is there, great. I do not want Brock Bowers. I said it. I don't want Brock Bowers. Okay. And I know whatever, it's just too risky. I don't want that. I don't need risk. I don't need another weapon. Joe Burrow can elevate weapons. I need protection for him. I need, I need, I'm thinking ahead people. I'm budgeting for the future and we need to get a tackle or a defensive tackle, uh, on that rookie deal who, who is good at the, in the first round. That's what I want. That's what I want. Okay. So the reason I bring up some of that is the announcement. Um, the guys I listen to a lot, my favorite uh, Cincinnati Bengals journalist is right here. Paul Daner Jr. Uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give him a shout out. Twitter. Paul Daner. Uh, um, he used to be at the Cincinnati Enquirer. Then uh, now he writes for the athletic and um He's a great writer. He knows the team inside and out. He uh, understands the Brown family, and he's just a lot of fun to listen to. He's had a podcast for multiple years, um, and he just branched out from the um, from the Athletic, where the, the, they own the podcast, and he launched his own. And so uh, I reached out to Paul they're, because they're looking for advertisers, and Team Sanders like, I'm in. Okay, so we've been working out over the last several weeks uh, to become an advertiser. But not only am I going to be an advertiser on the show, so hopefully, you know, we're going to cross pollinate here with some other Bengals fans. Uh, but I'm going to be a, a, a segment on the show. So uh, I, I don't know what that's going to be yet fully. But, um, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking about, um, you know, some Bengals stuff, some real estate stuff and, and probably some dad life stuff as well. That's what they kind of do on their Friday show. So if you guys haven't already be sure to go over and subscribe uh, to The Growler on YouTube. Uh, do it right now. Uh, watch their channel. They're great if you're a Bengals fan. Uh, also, you can download their podcast you know, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your, your podcast. But um, Paul's great. We're kind of like the same age. I think he graduated in 99 from Moeller. I graduated in 99 from Boone County High School. So basically, all of his jokes and references are of Seinfeld and uh, – survivor and everything else are right up my alley and make me laugh so there's that that's a big announcement uh eric stanio is going to be uh a sponsored guest on the old on the old growler podcast now i know that is niche 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 if you guys are watching from idaho or columbia or california wherever you are you don't care at all and that's okay but uh my wife asked me are you doing this because you think it's a good business idea or because you're just a fan of this guy and i'm like little bit of both, a little bit of both. Um, so that's me um, having fun and uh, trying to see if my the time that I spend listening to uh, mock drafts and Bengals offseason podcasts can be worth something. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. Hope that was helpful. Um, the real estate market is hot for sure. Uh, uh, back to the new construction thing. I know I've mentioned this before. If you guys are still watching, thank you. Um, be sure if you do want to go the new construction route, Reach out to us first. Don't fill out a form on the builder's website. Don't call them up. Don't go into a model home. Because if you do that and you don't register a real estate agent at that time, at that threshold meeting, you won't be able to get a real estate agent to represent you throughout your building process. And that's just a waste because the builder has built into their marketing budget 
a commission for the buyer's agent to represent you through the process. Now you're going to work, be working with both of us, but we can give you that oversight. Um, we do some of the, I mean, they use their contracts, but we're going to oversee some of that. If there's any time something comes up, we're going to help you out. We can help you negotiate on the front end and say like, is that the best you can do? Um, if they're not building something to your uh, specifications or quality, we, we can be like, you didn't build it to what we said you said you were going to build it to. So it's just nice to have a third party to do that with the builder and uh, have that agent representation to work alongside of, uh, of them while you're doing your new build. But you can't get that unless you let your agent threshold you, meaning create the introduction. Now, we can do that through email. We can do that through a phone call. We don't have to be there in person with you, but we just need to be the first person that says, hey, Fisher Homes, hey, Dries Homes, hey, MI Homes, hey, DR Horton, or whoever it is, or Custom Home Builder. Um, I've got a client. They're interested. They want to talk to you. Can you register me as their agent? And they're like, yeah, great. But it needs to happen on that front end um, because the builders want to be sure they're paying for leads that are coming in from the agents. Okay. Makes sense. So um, if you guys want to go new construction and by the way, kudos and shout out to you guys because uh, you are listening and paying attention. And uh, I've been getting a lot of you who are, who are saying, I didn't, I didn't like when we get on our phone call and we have our consultation or if you're doing it with one of my agents, um, you're telling me like, I want to go fish your homes, but I didn't talk to them yet because I watched your video. So thank you. Good job. I appreciate you guys. You're amazing. And, uh, we would love to continue to help you in your home search. Um, and we got some more, we got some listings coming up here as well. So if you're thinking of selling a home this year, um, we'd love to help you on that end as well. Um, Reds game coming up. We got, uh, we got to lock down a few things. Hopefully we can do it. It's been so busy guys. Whew, we've been helping a lot of you. It's been really good. I think we're in April. It will be our largest month that we've ever had, uh, by a fair amount. So, um, we've had a lot of closings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love helping you guys, um, find the right home for you. So thank you. In June, we are planning on locking down some red tickets for a Friday night game for everyone in the Daniel Clanio. Um, and uh, I'm pumped for that. So we had such a blast there last year. Um, we're going to try to blow it out. Last year, we had around 200 people. This year, I think we're going to try to uh, to knock it up to 500. So um, be on the lookout for that. Stay in your clan. You know. All right. I'm going to get out of here. Brandon, uh, appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all you guys who follow and subscribe and watch and reach out to us. Um, we are growing. Our, our team is growing. I've got... Uh, uh, in, uh, kind of a hiring meeting tomorrow with another agent who I'm super excited for um, to join the team uh, to help us as we continue to help more and more families find their home and strengthen their family. So appreciate you guys. Have a great Sunday night. Uh, hope you enjoyed the Masters and are chilling. Have a great Monday and uh, and week. And uh, who day? Let's go Reds. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, guys. See you.